Hi, Silvio. Uh, Hi, Xavi. I'm so excited that you're here and that um, you know, you've come to visit us in the Simons Institute, back to Berkeley after being a graduate student here for so many years. You know, especially I'm, I'm honored to interview you. Ooh, having it's, in it's such, a pleasure. I thought about that. <laughs> such a great <laughs> collaborator and even better friends for so many years. So, um, so Sylvia, tell me, how do you feel being back at Berkeley? First of all, I think very good. I have always a soft spot for, uh, for Berkeley, uh, of course. And uh, in some sense, uh, uh, people say that, you know, yet to be, um, be away for a long, long time to be able to realize that everything is back as it was. And so <laughs> right now, perhaps has been uh, such a long time and I really feel uh, back at home and, uh, as I left. That's wonderful. So you came to Berkeley in 1978? Is that no, 79, because uh, my English was so bad that I was admitted from the fall of 79. But uh, uh, finally, the, the score of the TOEFL, the test of English as a foreign language, was so poor to say, well, you are admitted, but you have to improve the, 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 the score. English. So uh, six months later, somehow I made it enough you know, uh, on, the, on the TOEFL to say, OK, we admit you. So I arrived, there was a trimester back then. And arrived, I don't know, at the third trimester, you know, and then uh, of the last trimester of 79. Then uh, we started in, in 80 together. That's right, that's right. So uh, you came in and you came from Rome, from the University of Rome. Yes, correct. And what made you go into computer science and uh, theoretical computer science and Berkeley? Oh, okay. So first of all, I started in physics for whatever reason. And, uh, but at that time, you know, we studied uh, uh, six months, a semester was dedicated to mathematics. And so I followed the calculus and uh, geometry uh, before doing any physics. And at that time, I decided math is whatever I wanted to do. And then um, the professor of math, uh, you know, calculus, of, of actually mathematical analysis at the time, he was saying, you know, don't do math, you know, it's for a young person, is, uh, um, don't do analysis at all, just to do physics, much better problems there. I said, well, I don't want to do physics, I want to do mathematics. Then he said, well, there is at least, you know, one branch of mathematics, and he told me about um, uh, Gettel's work or uh, Turing's work, and he says, if you really want, yet to do that. However, he warned me, you need to have a big stomach for those things. And so, I heard about a, a theoretical big computer science. A big stomach, you know, because it's not for the lighthearted, according to him, right? So he realized that we're... Um, so he was afraid of indigestion? I was afraid of indigestion. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so and I, I, of course, you know, he gave me the right advice, but I didn't follow it. I, I continued for a while in mathematical analysis. And then uh, finally, I took, you know, the la last year of, um, uh, before graduation, I took some uh, logic course and some lambda calculus course from um, uh, Corrado Bem. And I decided, you know what, um, uh, maybe discrete mathematics is actually a good idea. And I decided to, uh, to, uh, to make um, have my thesis uh, in lambda calculus. And so then I went to a graduate, uh, you know, it's a, it's a seminar, summer seminar in, um, in, uh, in algorithms. And mm -hmm. I suddenly learned about algorithms. So now I'm projecting from the continuous now to the very discrete, finally to algorithms. And then at, at the end I decided, you know, I want to do theoretical computer science. And what a better place to do it than in Berkeley. And so being uh, ignorant of the ways of the world, I only applied to Berkeley. Likely enough, I got in, and, uh, and, and now here I am, a graduate student in Berkeley. At Berkeley. And at that time in Berkeley, there are all these uh, theorists, which because we were graduate students together, I remember that I thought that they were ancient, but I think they were much younger than we are today. Right? There were, are you kidding? Absolutely. There was Descartes, yes. Manuel Blum, Jean Lawler, yes. and they seem like they've been around forever, right? Yes, and uh, Andy Yao just uh, arrived, you know, just uh, um, maybe a year before, or just arrived at the same in 1980, and uh, yeah, it was really the place to be in theoretical computer science retrospectively, right? I thought so, he arrived in 82. 82? Yeah. Much later, yes. Yeah, I thought so. Right. Yeah. Yes, it was a place to be. And uh, do you remember anything about those days, about your cohorts of graduate students, or the kind of classes you took, or the atmosphere? 
the atmosphere was always a very collaborative, right? And uh, so somehow uh, the graduate students, uh, you being one, uh, you know, it was a kind of a band of brothers, right? Who decided to <laughs> unleash ourselves on the town as well as uh, uh, on uh, mathematical problems. And um, uh, I, I mean, I, I really remember to take a, a course in algorithm from uh, Dick and uh, the CARP and uh, to uh, collaborate with VJ. And uh, VJ was able, was better organized than I was, uh, to follow, to do research and uh, follow the course. I was terrible, so I essentially dropped the course. But uh, at the end of the day, we finally had uh, an algorithm for general matching, which uh, uh, we are very proud of. And I continue to be proud of, of that result. And then uh, later on, there was Manuel Blum with his course on, um, on uh, computational number theory with application to cryptography. And then I believe uh, you and I together decided that uh, cryptography was uh, so exciting and nobody knew anything about it. It was not an academic discipline. The last three lectures were about cryptography. And uh, what a better promise to work on when something is totally undefined, ill-defined, you know, unclear what it is. Uh, and, and that's what um, um, we started doing. And there was um, no looking back at that point. So I, I really remember that you know, the teachers were great. Uh, um, at Berkeley, but I think we learn from each other at least as much as we learn from our uh, uh, great teachers, and uh, that was um, uh, really a, uh, a lesson for life. I really believe that interaction really is uh, the way to go. If you want, particularly if you want to tame a, a new field, because uh, you need to have you know immediate feedback, and um, and, and sometimes there is a, a lot of depression on being able to to solve the problems right away. And uh, so if you are together, somehow at least one or can be in a good enough mood to re-emerge and uh, continue. That's true. So you've actually described that in a very short period of three, four years, I don't know if you realize this, you went from working on lambda calculus and logic to working on graph algorithms. And yes. you, what you did in graph algorithms was a result yes. that stood for many, many years. I don't actually know if there is actually already a better algorithm. For general graphs, no. That's right. And yours was for general graphs, yes. right? So you went from logic and lambda calculus to graph algorithms and then to cryptography. Now, yeah. cryptography, I know the story, but I'd like our <laughs> viewers to know the story. Um, you know, today we have programs at Simons about pseudo-randomness, you know, the whole program is being dedicated to it. But at the time, that field did not exist. So do you remember sort of the, the beginning of uh, sort of your thesis, your work on randomness, pseudo-randomness versus hardness? Well, um, yes. So I, I, I do remember. First of all, I remember uh, that Manuel mentioned uh, this uh, problem of mental poker that uh, somehow you and I uh, decided to attack. In retrospect, it was a very hard problem, but we were able to distill out a very meaningful piece, which was you know, uh, encryption. And, and so we started working on encryption, probabilistic encryption, because when you deal with encrypting just a few cards, there is only 52 of them, so you need to have the encryption to be probabilistic and uh, define what it means to hide the partial information and so on and so forth. But for, um, for um, and then later on, we start doing a multi-party protocol uh, later. For, um, for um, pseudo-randomness, I really remember one thing, that once I, got these little books about uh, science. And uh, I was not a scientist when I grew up. I was doing a high school, uh, in, was a classical high school. I was doing a literature, philosophy, history, uh, Greek, Latin, whatever. But um, very little mathematics, ex except for Euclidean ge geometry. And uh, it was enough, by the way, to hook me onto math. But, but I remember I, I had this popularization of various things. And it was uh, this book about tides in which they say that even though the equations of tides are very, very well known, it's part of a really Newtonian mechanics, totally understood, somehow the calculation, the steps were so intricate that somehow there was uh, randomness emerged from this thing. And I... So they explicitly discussed that in this book? I just, um, yeah, as, as, a, as a, a, a footnote to mm -hmm. say, well, why do we study these things? They are so predictable. The moon, you know, we should, we should, we should know exactly what happened. Right. And they complain that you don't quite know. And you, you start seeing, you know, uh, something. And so somehow I got to this idea that maybe, you know, it, is, it is, uh, has, has something to do with the computation is so long. What the hell I knew? 
right? So, but it's about that thought stuck in my mind. And you know, I really believe that the thoughts are stuck in our mind, and then uh, with education, scientific education, you just have to be able to elaborate with the initial thoughts. But it's the initial thoughts that hook us, okay? So finally, uh, so we were exposed, uh, not in, a, in a precise form, to the notion of a, a one-way function. Right. And uh, so that's it. I got convinced that this one-way function, so easy in one direction and hard in, one di in the other direction, was the key to pseudo-randomness because you want to generate fast the, the bits, the, uh, the random bits, but you want to them to be unpredictable. And that was actually the subject of my PhD thesis, is how to generate a pseudo random bits you know, based on uh, cryptographic function. Even the title was uh, <laughs> very complex. So, yeah, I, I really, uh, that was the idea that somehow uh, things were random because you didn't have enough time to predict exactly. And uh, not so only so, but you can amplify this uh, a little bit uncertainty to really make it a zero one with essentially probability 50-50 of ability of predicting, at least in any finite time. Yes. And so, so in general, uh, cryptography at the time was about communication. Pseudo-random generation was not a part of uh, communication. It was a different breed. And uh, so somehow the notion that instead that you could use the same tool for cryptography for doing pseudo-random generation um, uh, was, uh, was new. And uh, at this point, you know, the way we understand you know, complexity basic cryptography essentially be has become a science of uh, computation in the presence of an adversary. And the adversary can try to figure out what message we're exchanging. The adversary can try to figure out what the next bit that we generate in a pseudo-random generator are. The adversary is going to try to convince you of a false statement in a proof. Uh, the adversary is everywhere. And um, It's interesting that you mentioned the adversary. So um, there's a two, s several threads here. Uh, one is this uh, existence of the adversary, which is common to all of these seemingly different challenges like private communication or sort of random generation, which is unpredictable. Uh, then another thread that you've mentioned is uh, the idea that hardness, that something that uh, seems hard to compute has, is, is very strongly linked to uh, unpredictability, which today I think we take as a given in this field. Yes. But it is really a quite, quite, quite a deep uh, insight. Um, I, uh, it's, it's, and I think it's, uh, it's beautiful the way that these two things uh, connect together. I want to uh, uh, pick up on something else that you mentioned. You talked about multi-party computation. So multi-party computation is a development that happened a little bit later yes. when I think you moved to MIT, right? You had um, some work where uh, there was several people, they're collaborating, each one has an input, and somehow they'd like to collaborate com collectively, compute a common output without revealing to each other the input more than is implied by the function value. So it took many, many years, but today that seems to be something that is actually known uh, widely to the scientific community. I don't know if you know that. In the Congress they've discussed this. There are some special uh, interest groups who are discussing multi-party computation, multi-party collaborations as a way to do things we cannot do otherwise. Uh, uh, sure. I mean, uh, that makes sense, right? So, um, so the law very often tries to, uh, to convince us to do the honest thing by punishing whenever we deviate. But the best thing is to make a deviation impossible. Or, for instance, um, there is uh, all kinds of uh, situations in which you, know, you, want to, you want to punish inside trading. But if you do uh, at the right uh, type of multi-party computation, if you can say, hey, I, I couldn't do inside trading because I, I didn't know what was going on, how can I do inside training if everything is encrypted and we compute on this, uh, on this encryption, encrypted data? So yes, the, the possibility is, is, uh, is there. So to me, uh, I all, I'm, I'm always an impatient man. So it was very frustrating to see that uh, some of this research, which was uh, clearly going to affect the way we conduct our life, we can conduct you know, uh, business uh, interactions in a secure way, in an open way, and yet uh, in a private way, uh, correct uh, and privacy together. And you know, it, it took a long time to right. this, um, 
to invest um, ideas to trickle into yes. into products that we can actually use uh, um, routinely. And uh, to me, we are still not quite there yet in the widespread adoption of these things. So yeah. it was a good lesson to see that you know it takes time. It is good to it takes time for basic research to um, um, to to become you know available to society. And that's by the way why it's important to continue funding uh, you know basic research because <laughs> it it takes a long time, but it will uh, give you know great uh, fruits and revolutionize the way we interact with each other. Absolutely. In another place, apparently, um, that uh, multi-party computation, the same kind of multi-party computation that we were talking about in the 80s and at Berkeley in the beginning, then at MIT, is being used now in machine learning. Why? Because when they're doing uh, training of models, they need to take yep. a lot of data from a lot of different sources. And uh, they want people don't necessarily want to contribute their data. Organizations don't necessarily want to contribute their data. So they have something called federated learning, where you have essentially multi-party computation among the contributors of data that they go through a protocol where they contribute their data to learn machine models. And this is like bread and butter. So do they contribute, sorry, to have a larger set of... Uh... So you're, you want to come up with a model, with a machine learning algorithm, uh -huh. but that model is data-driven, okay? It's not that you know how this program is going to run. The data is going to somehow teach you how to develop the model, like a, a neural okay. net. Yeah. So uh, who, where is this data coming from? These are data of individuals. And the example that people usually use is that uh, on, okay, your, okay. on your iPhone, you type, and they want to come up with predictive correction of text. Yep. But there's many users. And these yes. users don't necessarily want everybody to know what they're typing. So you want to do a multi-party computation among many users where uh, you don't know what a single user is doing, but altogether this is going to serve as data for training machine learning algorithms. So that's again another example for impact from cryptographic protocol from the 80s to something that's being done today and has been hailed as one of the biggest impacts on industry. So coming back to you, since we're All interviewing right. you. Yep, yep, yep. We're only in the 80s. <laughs> We're only around 86, 87. And after that, you went and did a whole bunch of work on distributed computing, on uh, uh, Byzantine agreement and consensus. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, uh, so somehow I really believe, you know, uh, Byzantine agreement is a quintessential way, you know, um, uh, to uh, keep a consistent view of the world in the presence, you know, um, uh, in a fault-tolerant way, right? And uh, the best way to model um, faults is uh, to have uh, an adversary. Again, now we go back to the adversary. Because given any system, if it is complex enough and you wait long enough, it behaves as if it is a really a malicious adversary. So, so you might as well model that way. So it makes sense that, uh, the, uh, to discuss about you know, um, um, uh, um, uh, reaching agreement in presence of, of, of adversary. And the problem was uh, defined by pieces of Shostak and Lamport um, uh, in the 80s. And, uh, but somehow the protocols were uh, very, very, very slow. And uh, because of, um, you had to, um, to have uh, as many steps in the protocol as uh, potentially bad players plus one. So if the number of players is large, then uh, you had to wait for a long time to reach a Byzantine agreement, right? And so somehow, I thought I would say, hey, you know, I know something about adversary, but I'm not computing in, in, in front of adversary. I want to try my hand at the problem. And actually, my first PhD, uh, I granted was on um, uh, to um, uh, a PhD to a student to a, to a student. This right? is Paul Feldman, right? Paul Feldman, yes. And um, uh, he, he, he graduated in '85, and uh, and uh, with uh, a thesis on um, on. Um, um, on Byzantine agreement. And I really felt that, you know, I really respected the distributed computation. And, uh, and uh, having solved that problem, I felt uh, as a check, you know, now we solve other problems. And uh, strange enough, and then uh, re-emerged in my uh, more recent uh, research of the problem of Byzantine agreement. So, again. in fact, that was the next thing that I wanted to ask you about. Although we're skipping a whole period where we, you worked about bi on biology, on finding a cure for AIDS for some point you were interested uh, in. Etiology of AIDS, different. Finding, uh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. um, and then you worked on algorithmic game theory and yes. auctions. Uh, but let's kind of uh, fast forward. And uh, what are you interested in today? What are you working on today? I know that it has to do with okay. Byzantine agreement and cryptography, but I'd like to hear it from you. Well, you know, I, um, I'm working on um, uh, distributed ledgers, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and somehow blockchains. Uh, and so somehow the, the idea 
<laughs> with the blockchains, we are now over 2,000 proposals, right, on how, how to do these things. And, but uh, they are mostly a variant of, of, of each other. So what do you want there? You want to have, you know, a set of data, like a, uh, organized in blocks, one block after another, mm -hmm. and so, you, so that you cannot uh, alter the content of the blocks, and you cannot alter the order of the blocks, so that's the, hence the chain. And, but, you know, guess what? This is not a static data. You want to keep on adding blocks. So all these 2,000 things, they use the same technology. It's very primitive cryptographies of, uh, of 50 years ago. It's 2,000 uh, blockchains. Yeah, so I do. Mm -hmm. they do. The chain is actually the same in every, in every project. But they do some hashing. The hash of one block is part of the other block, and that prevents you from uh, altering the content without this alteration to be visible and percolates uh, everywhere. But guess what? But the whole problem is how do you who is in charge of generating the new block. Mm -hmm. And that's where the whole problem is, right? And, uh, and so uh, people have found, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Nakamoto. Um, on uh, Bitcoin. On Bitcoin, mm -hmm. they figure out a way which is to create a very uh, a big puzzle, which is very hard to solve. And the first one to solve it in some sense has the right to do a block. So that's way you say, who has the right? Hey, work very, very, very hard on this problem. The first one to win or solve it has the right to, to, uh, to, uh, to generate a new block. That's one way. It creates a lot of, uh, uh, it's kind of slow because you have to wait for, for this uh, problem to be, to be solved. It's very expensive. And uh, strange enough for reasons that aren't something to do with uh, with incentives that somehow generates a you know, concentration of power in a, what you want is that a distributed ledger is that somehow nobody's in charge, right, of this uh, all ever growing database and, uh, and that defeats the purpose. Um, other ways uh, are going to say, okay, we don't want to spend so much energy, here is what we do, we put, you know, a few people in charge, a few because you manage to get more efficient that way, and they are in charge of choosing the next block. Well, is this decentralized? Uh, no. And they have all kinds of other variations, um, uh, so-called the proof of stake, um, um, which, you know, somehow at a higher scrutiny, uh, they look good, but they're not, in my opinion, as good as they, they should be to guarantee really a decentralization of the system. And so all of a sudden, I, I thought of one, one side of the problem, so maybe, how about we agree on the block? but to have really the entire community agree on the block. So I dusted off all this notion of a Byzantine agreement and tried to, and tried to figure out if uh, we can make it so efficient and uh, so compelling so that you know, to allow even a billion uh, people to, to agree. agree on a block mm -hmm. very quickly. And, uh, and, and without having a computation, without having a centralization in any shape or form. And uh, so somehow that was uh, what I've been working on. Um, and that is only one piece. <laughs> that has, you know, the other pieces that, you know, has something to do with uh, designing a system of incentives uh, and so on and so forth um, to keep you know, the system operating properly. And I understand also part of uh, having this large-scale Byzantine agreement is uh, how to select uh, a subcommittee that will actually agree. And the selection of the subcommittee, again, has a, sort of a random selection or a pseudo-random selection. So if we go back to your pseudo-random days, that actually weighs in on oh, this yes, yes, current yes. interest. Yes, uh, so in some sense, you know, um, so, okay, so uh, rather than having a billion people agree on something, say, uh, here is one idea. The billion people agree on a thousand people, and then the thousand people agree on a block. So, wow, that should be working, because from a billion to a thousand, you have, a, you know, an order of um, um, uh, six order of magnitudes uh, efficiency. But can you imagine uh, a billion people can agree on anything? Never, n not on a committee, who then agrees on the block. They might as well agree on the block di uh, directly, right? So. Um, so the question is that you know, how do you somehow, how somehow do you select this committee? And uh, strange enough, the, uh, the idea, at least that, that is, uh, that I thought I'm, 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 I'm utilizing here, is to have these people to select themselves, but in a way that forces themselves not to cheat. 
so that even though you are in charge of selecting your, yourself, think about it that you have you know, um, an individual lottery that is only uh, personalized to you, and uh, you try to, uh, it takes a microsecond to see if you win this lottery or not, you cannot alter the result in the same microsecond, so to speak, you know, I and everybody else see if they, uh, they won. The people who win have the proof that they won, and they come out to say, here is my winning ticket, I'm part of this committee, and here is my opinion about the block, so, so to speak, right? And so the idea is to have a really uh, um, uh, cryptographic randomness and algorithmic randomness. It comes really to, to the rescue, and in particular, a particular brand of, um, as you know, we, we mentioned uh, generation of set of random bits. Together, um, we did, you know, um, um, uh, 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 and we voted uh, uh, pseudo-random uh, function uh, generators from generator to functions. And here we need uh, a special other thing, which is a verifiable random functions, which you know, came very late in this uh, progress of algorithmic randomness. The result of, um, um, so I was um, uh, in good company with um, uh, Michael Rabin uh, and uh, Salil Vadan, and uh, we are in the 2000. And it is that variant, because in a, in a, in a verifiable random function, you actually, uh, you can, so you, you, you can actually use it uh, yourself, because you know, uh, everybody's guaranteed that on any input, uh, you are forced, even if you choose, your keys in a special way to have a very actually random output. And that's what makes the whole thing convincing. So it's a beautiful combination, you know, so there's pseudo-randomness or verifiable pseudo-randomness. There is Byzantine agreement. There is the notion of a committee that gets elected. And, uh, and at the end, you know, there is this block that's being posted on a blockchain. But we all know that the interest in some sense in blockchain is uh, um, commercial in the sense that uh, yeah. the reason why the public knows about it is because of this cryptocurrency, which has kind of cut their imagination. Uh, so I find it interesting that whereas early on our inventions, it took a long time to come to fruition in the sense of impact, uh, here uh, the impact of, uh, of all your work coming together into blockchains, the, the theoretical ideas in the impact are coming at the same time, um, it feels. Uh, a, so, uh, first of all, I wonder what your thoughts about that is, how, how theory and practice are coming closer together these days. And two, um, can you tell us a little bit about applications of distributed ledgers and blockchains beyond currency? Okay. <laughs> I have to choose uh, uh, the answers. Uh, let's start with the latter, because I remember uh, okay. uh, if I forget the There are two first, questions. Uh, yeah. two questions you, you theory and practice coming, uh, coming at the same time, much more so than in the, in the past. And the second is uh, applications of blockchains yeah. beyond so, currency. Uh, okay. So first of all, um, um, theory and practice, uh, I don't believe that uh, necessarily we are now entering an age in, a, in which you know, theory and practice are now close together. Um, it, it occurs in the Renaissance and other things, which there were really times in which you know, the distance, uh, temporal distance between theory and practice was very, um, very small. But I believe that you know, we are going to have another example, so we are going to go back to the good old ways in which you know, the theory is developed for a, for, for a while and, uh, and somehow the practice uh, lags behind for a variety of reasons, uh, social, uh, cultural, um, uh, political, and everything else. So, but never, never mind that. So, um, so what, what, what is an application? In my opinion, if, if you look at, uh, yes, um, um, by the way, having you know, a, a, mean of, uh, a medium of exchange is a great application of ledgers, right? And, and to have a cryptocurrency that really scales and is a medium of exchange would be great. But by the way, we are not there yet, right? Because whatever products are out there, they, they lack the, uh, they lack the, the throughput uh, and the, the security adequate. Okay. Um, so practice is not there practice yet. Practice is not there yet. But, but in my opinion, the real application of these ledgers is uh, to leverage trust that is diffused across the society and concentrated into an interaction between you and an individual. So let me give you an example. Assume that we live in different continents, right? And assume that um, we want, so therefore we don't know each other, so there is very little trust about, about each other. And so what do we want to do is that we want to say, uh, to do a simple operation, like a digitally sign a, a contract, okay? 
So we have negotiated a contract. Now we know what the contract should look like. As I say, it's Shafi. Now we are uh, far away, digitally signed, and send in your digital signature, and I promise to digitally contract sign. And now we have an executed contract, because both signature has to be there. And, you, and what you're going to say is, Silvio, brilliant. But let me suggest a better idea. Sure. So you digitally sign first, and then I promise to digitally contract sign later. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, because whoever uh, signs first is on the hook, right? And, uh, no, and the other one is not on the hook. And so, you know, we can uh, communicate at the speed of light, we can do anything of it, but whoever takes the first action, that is a strategic thinking, has nothing to do with the speed of light. And so if we, there is not enough trust, nobody wants to go first. So how do we solve these problems? Okay, we go to a trusted party, uh, call it a judge, if we know, but um, call it Goldman Sachs if it is a financial application, assuming that we are <laughs> Goldman Sachs are, are trusted. But you know, first of all, problem number one, we do not have, we may not have a, a, a trusted third party that uh, we both with trust. What do we do? Second, even if we have this trusted party, how the transaction looks like? Oh, that's easy. When the transaction looks like, say, you shall receive, dear trusted party, a contract digitally signed by Shafi, verify her signature. You shall also receive a contract digitally signed by Silvio, verify his signature. Then verify that bit by bit by bit, the contract that Silvio and Shafi sign is absolutely identical. If so, swap, give Shafi yes. Silvio's signature and say, you know what, this is going to take two days because we have to explain whatever we need for this trusted party. But never mind that. Trusted party wanted to be paid. So it's going to have, you know, an accompany bill of $2,000 to the trusted party to enable us to transact. So it's going to take two days and $2,000. I'm making you know, numbers out of thin air, but sure. you get the idea. Okay, assume there is instead a ledger in which blocks appear, let's say every few seconds, and everybody sees the content of these blocks, and everybody knows that whatever I see, everybody else also sees, right. is a kind of a common knowledge situation. Yeah. Then I'm going to say, hey, Shaf, you know, you know what? Fine, I go first. But the way I go first, at an abstract level, is like this. I say, I, Silvio, oblige myself with this contract with Shafi, if and only if my signatures and Shafi's signatures together appear in block, say, 151. Assume the current block is 150. A few seconds later, I'm going to look in this ledger that is the same for everybody. That's the beauty. And now, case one, my signature and your signature are there. Then we have a valid contract. Right. Okay? If my signature is there, is not, yours is not, or the other way around, I'm free to uh, sell the house, whatever the contract is, to somebody else. Great. Because I know that everybody else sees that is only mine and not also yours who are there, right? Time, few seconds. Cost, zero. Nobody beats this. And I don't need to trust you, right? So we are leveraging a trust spread out and be able to concentrate in an interaction, a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And I think that, you know, that is going to generate so much uh, potential, as the potential to generate so much uh, trust in, in, uh, in, in, in society that it's going to enable not only to, uh, to pay each other, but, not, but also to, to do more sophisticated transactions like this. And by the way, smart contracts, which is still way above all this is a very uh, interesting way to do things. And uh, therefore, in some sense, these ledgers, uh, if, uh, trust is uh, quintessential right, in, in human interaction. So if you can generate trust out of thin air, because, tell you the truth, I trust the fact that the majority of society is, uh, is honest, but I don't know a particular individual is honest or not. So I'm going to be very... Uncertain. I go back to a centralized world in which you know a few people decides uh, make themselves the trusted parties, and right. they, if you want to transact, you have to transact for them. No, there is a better alternatives. We can organize ourselves, you know, in uh, in direct ways. So potentially there is a great application for these things. But again, we must realize this potential, and it's only technology that at the end uh, is going to make this possible. Okay.
Yeah, I agree with you. So actually, we're having a, a semester here in the fall on distributed ledgers and, and distributed Perfect. consensus, which hopefully a lot of these ideas are going to be flush and there will be sort of future applications, maybe more yes. technology. I just want to um, touch on one point that you've mentioned throughout the interview, which we didn't talk about, and that is you talked about Paul Feldman, who was your first PhD student. Yep. You've had a lot of PhD PhD students since. They've gone on yes. to do great things. They're in many universities around the world. Um, how do you feel about these students? I mean, what's your... I mean, first of all, I reveal. So I'm extremely proud of um, my students. So I think that, you know, has been a really a gift to help them. But <laughs> the truth is that they help me way more than I help them, right? And, uh, and that is, uh, I believe, that is a really great gift to be an educator and to be in academia that... Uh, somehow you are in touch with um, young people and I really believe that uh, young people are always right. And so if you, there is no better way to figure out if a problem is good or not than to try to say, how about we try to solve this problem? Eh, there is a lukewarmish thing, maybe the problem is not important. But if there is any chance <laughs> the problem is good, I mean, the students will get it immediately. And, uh, and after that, everything is easy. So I really think that it's really a privilege to be an educator and actually a beneficiary of being in touch with his, uh, with his uh, future generations. And, um, so let me give you a compliment as a final Please remark. <laughs> and that is that I think you are a great educator, not only to your students, but also to your colleagues. And uh, I remember this uh, originally, and also for years, that, uh, you, that you had this gift of explaining things to me. Like you would explain things, and then I would understand them. Uh, and it wasn't really explaining a method, but there was something about the way you would articulate what's important, what's not important, that was really quite, uh, quite a gift and a helpful one. Well, first of all, thank you for the interview. Thank you for the compliment. The truth of the matter is that I'm, it's so hard for me to understand anything <laughs> by the time which I, I understand it. Maybe I'm also capable of explaining. And so the, my secret is to be sad, hard of understanding. <laughs> and so somehow it perhaps it works well, to, to the advantage of everybody. Whatever works. Whatever works. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Shafi. Thank you.